Alexander had a, a pretty rough ride here for you in the essay. She was supposed to arrive at midday yesterday. She finally arrived at about 9 o'clock last night. She was a little bit tired in the evening because she sort of just collapsed over this afternoon. Not surprisingly. Anyway, I'm very pleased to welcome Alex tonight to give us a lovely talk on that you like. Thank, Thank you, Sandy. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Four and a half billion years ago, a star was born and our sun started to shine. And soon after this, the Earth and the other planets were formed and light began its eight minute flight to Earth. The science and art have moved forward together in the quest to understand light, light from the sun, the moon and the stars. And of course, ancient cultures worshipped the sun, their lives depended upon it, and darkness could bring danger and death. And of course, in Britain, the Neolithic Britons, they built Stonehenge to mark and then to celebrate the longest and the shortest days of the year. So we have the summer and the winter solstices. So for the, those of you who um, are not from England, uh, the summer solstice, on the 21st of June, they have 17 hours of daylight, but on the 21st of December, on the winter solstice, we only get eight hours of daylight. So very, very different. I was surprised how dark it was when I arrived here last night. And it's, it must be quite different, the attitude, in a way, to light here compared to in Britain. Because as, the, as you get less and less and less light towards the winter solstice, the sort of spiritual significance of the light grows. It gets more and more sort of mysterious because it becomes more and more important. And I'm wondering really over here, you know, what the attitude to light is. And of course, you obviously celebrate Diwali, the festival of light. Um, but still, it must be slightly different here, the sense of magic about light that we have over in Britain compared to here, as we get so little of it in winter. But the quest to understand light as a phenomena of nature begins in ancient Greece in the 5th century BC. It then moves to China, then to Baghdad, Cairo, medieval France, Italy, and then to England in the Age of Enlightenment into the hands of Isaac Newton and Thomas Young. And then in the 20th century, the science of light, or optics as we call it, enters a realm incredibly difficult to understand into the realm of quantum physics or quantum mechanics, pioneered by James Maxwell Clark, Max Planck and Einstein. Well, here we have an image of the World Wide Web, which is powered by light. And you could say that we've now entered the age of light. We're sort of leaving the age of coal and fossil fuels and oil into the age of light, because light is really powering our societies today. Also, light is used in surgery. It heal, does things like healing detached retinas. It's even used now to detect certain cancers in the form of lasers. It plays DVDs. And light from our liquid crystal displays brings us all our screens on our computers, on our laptops, etc., on our HD, on our TV screens. It's all powered by liquid crystal displays. So when you look very, very closely, you know, with a magnifying glass at your screen, it all breaks down into pixels, doesn't it? Into little square blocks of color. And all the color that you're seeing on that screen has been generated by just the three major wavelengths of light, red, green, and blue. So every color that you see is, has been created by a combination of those, just those three primary light waves. And it's, it's all, you know, it's quite extraordinary what we're being able to create out of, from light, basically. Of course, we also have um, solar panels generating electricity. And when you, send, when, when you send your email via broadband, the, that is traveling through fiber optic cables, and the force that enables that to travel are light pulses. So we are in the age of light. So here we have a, a portrait of Isaac Newton, 
known for his three major discoveries, universal gravitation, the calculus, and his theory of optics, that light consists of a spectrum of colors, and each of those colors, or each of those wavelengths, has their own refractivity. So here he is performing his famous two-prism light experiment in 1672. And in his, in his rooms in Trinity College, Cambridge, he got two prisms, not one, he got two prisms. And he has two pieces of card resting on the table there. And with the first prism hold at the window, he manages to split the white light into the colors of the spectrum onto that board. But you can just see in the red wavelength section, just, just there, he's made a little hole, and he's holding the second prism behind it. And again, the red light wave is reflected onto the second card. So he's able to separate the wavelengths, and each of those wavelengths has their own refractivity. So this was his, his major discovery. It was also with Newton that he, he spent a lot of time researching, into, obviously looking at the colors of the spectrum and studying the rainbow. And up until Newton, people thought that the rainbow just consisted of five colors. So you had red, yellow, green, blue, violet. But what he did is that he related the colors of the spectrum to an octave in music and the lengths of the strings of an instrument needed to play an octave. So with an octave, you, you think you have eight notes, but in a way you have just seven notes if you don't repeat the first note, if you see what I mean. And so by, looking, by comparing the spectrum to the octave, he had to find two more colors, basically. And so by, he then decided that there was actually another two colors, which we now call orange and indigo. But, I mean, when you actually look at a rainbow, it's quite difficult to see seven colors. We generally do just see five colors. We, only, we think we see seven because we've been told there's an orange and an indigo, but it's actually very difficult to see. So from that time on, from Newton onwards, when artists were going to paint a rainbow, they'd paint seven colors because Newton had told them that there were seven colors. Well, this is a painting by Monet from the 1870s, and I'll talk about Impressionism much later in the lecture. Uh, but I just wanted to show you, you know, here is an artist who is responding to the effects of light, and he's painting a woman in a white dress. Uh, but you can see he's put an awful lot of blue in it because he's perceiving that when you've got a very white cloth in on a sunny day, the shadows reflect the blue of the sky. And up until the Impressionists, artists didn't do this. Uh, they, they, were, they weren't, for instance, in the, they weren't outside in nature seeing exactly what went on. Their view of nature was, their view of nature in their art was a conception of nature, whereas the Impressionists were the first people to go out there and actually paint what they see. But the reason, I've just put this, this image up just to say, just to talk to you about, to tell you, remind you, what actually light is. What do we know of light today? Well, we do know that the universe is kind of pulsating with, with energy, with all different types of energy, and we call it the electromagnetic spectrum, electromagnetic waves. So we have radio waves, gamma rays, microwaves, X-rays, ultraviolet, infrared, and visible white light. And it's the visible white light that we're able to see. So invisible white light consists of different wavelengths, and each visible, each wavelength has a particular color. So the, the wavelength, the, the color with the longest wavelength is the violet and blue end of the spectrum. Sorry, I got it wrong. The, sh the longest wavelength is the red end of the spectrum, and the shortest wavelength is the violet and then the blue. Okay. Um, also, we know that light is both a particle and a wave. It was Einstein who calls them photons. Photons have their own energy. They're not dependent upon a, a, a third sort of force uh, or a medium enabled to enable light to travel. Newton thought that light had to travel through on some sort of substance, and he called it ether whereas Einstein proved that this was not the case, that photons themselves have their own energy. 
so it doesn't need an, another a form for, it to, for, it, for light to travel towards us. I'd just like to quote you from a scientist what he says about light being such a mysterious thing. He says, sometimes it behaves like a stream of particles, like a constant barrage of microscopic cannonballs, carrying energy we can see through the air at extremely high speeds. Other times, light behaves more like waves on the sea. Instead of water moving up and down, light is a wave pattern of electrical and mag magnetic energy vibrating through space. Well, this is a, a painting by the German artist Emil Nolder called Giant Poppies, Red, 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 from 1942. And I could well show you this picture tomorrow in my lecture on red. But I'm just putting it up as an example to, to talk about how we actually see things, how we act, what actually happens to, to us, to our brains and our eye, uh, and the object itself when light falls upon it. So with these giant poppies, say these poppies were in the dark, the electrons would be just quietly floating in clouds held, held within the molecules. And then when, say, a beam of light shines upon those poppies, and actually, it actually causes the electrons to rearrange themselves. It's an actual activity that's taking place, and it's called transition. And what happens was, is that the electrons kind of zoom up to a different energy level, and the amount of energy used up in that process is, is, is the amount of white light, the amount of white light is absorbed by the electrons, and what isn't absorbed is then reflected back to us, and that's what we then see. So in this, in this situation, we're seeing it as red because all the visible white light, except red, has been absorbed in that process of transition. We, and what's left out, what is reflected back to us, is the red. So we then see that as red. And that information then travels down through our optic nerve to our brain, which then informs us that we're, we're seeing red. We're seeing a red poppy. We then attach emotional significance or symbolism to the poppy, or, or att attach kind of emotional qualities to red, being a color of danger or excitement or passion, these sorts of things. And so that's the sort of process that takes place when we look at something like a red poppy. So here we have two diagrams to show you the difference between the three primaries in light and the three primaries in pigment. So on the left, you've got the three primary wavelengths of light, which is green, red, and blue. And then you have the secondary wavelengths, yellow, magenta, and cyan. And those all come together to create white light. Without light, you have darkness. You have the black on the outside there. Is different with pigment. So on the right, you've got magenta, yellow, or cyan, or red, yellow, blue, and those are the three primaries in, in organic pigment. So <clears throat> if you want to mix up a green out of your paints, you mix together yellow and blue. Uh, but you don't need to mix a color, a green, if you're using light. So if you're a stage set designer or a lighting designer, you, d you don't need to um, combine yellow and blue lights to create green. You've already got the green wavelength, but you do need to combine red and green to create a yellow with light. With light. So it is it's different, which is quite interesting. Uh, when you fill your computer printers, you also have to put in a black, because it's only kind of theoretical that if you mix together the three primaries, you get black. You don't. You just get a sort of khaki gray, khaki green color. So you have to also have a black cartridge as well to create the, the pure black um, out of the three primaries. So just to remind you how we actually see how the eye works. So <clears throat> the light comes towards us um, from the candle. It goes, goes through the cornea, which is that protective layer over the eye. It refracts onto the lens, and then it refracts again onto the back of the eye, into the retina. And you get a perfect image, but it's always upside down. And then within the retina are photoreceptor cells. You have the rods and the cones, and so the, the cones are able to perceive 
short wavelength, medium wavelength, and long wavelength, are the, are the, in other words, blue, green, and, and yellow. And the rods are involved in perceiving white through to greys, all shades of greys to black. So, for instance, if you're, if you're a cat, cats have 10 times more rods than us humans, so they're able to see much, much better than we are in the dark. Uh, but we have many more cones than they do, so we can see, apparently they think we can see about up to 10 million different colours. Um, <clears throat> So anyway, so then the inf that, that information then travels down the optic nerve to the brain, which then writes the image up the right way and tells us we're looking at a candle. The language then all comes into play, of course. But for instance, again, um, for instance, fish, they can see ultraviolet, where we can't see ultraviolet. So we're only seeing a section of reality. Um, you know, there's a whole lot more that can be seen, um, but we can't, we can't see it. So that's just a very quick potted description of, of, of light. And now we're going to look at how artists have tried to use light in their work, in their work uh, using light, light effects to create drama, atmosphere, and a more sense of, kind of three-dimensional illusionary space on a two-dimensional surface. So this is a, a fresco from 70 AD. And it's in the house of Julia Felix in Pompeii, and it's a, it's a still life. It's uh, just a glass bowl of fruit, a jar of wine, and a jar of raisins. But you can see here how in 70 AD, this artist is fascinated in how to create an illusion of space, of depth, of rec recessive depth on a flat surface. And he's done that by using highlights on the fruit and then shadows. So there's a sense of kind of tonality in the picture. And this creates a roundedness to the forms. And by putting shadows underneath an object on a surface between another object, that creates a sense of kind of the object is actually sitting on a surface. It's not just floating in space. Without that shadow there, this would just be kind of floating. So having the highlights and then the shadow, that creates a sense of roundedness to the objects. So that's what they're interested in, in is in that illusion. So although this is during the time of the, of the Roman Empire, um, with the defeat of the Greek Empire by the Romans, Greek artists were then employed by wealthy Roman households to, to make their work. And we know from historical records that the Greek artists were highly skilled at creating illusions of depth and three dimensions on their paintings, but there's no surviving Greek painting at all. So we just know about it really from what the, the Roman, um, what we see in Roman art, um, <clears throat> what they inherited from, from the Greek art. They called this sort of painting, the Greeks called it shadow painting. And then later on, you know, the Romans and the Italians, they called it chiascuro, becomes the term used for using kind of light and dark and shadow effects in their work. So as I said in the beginning, the, the Greek quest to understand light, that began in the 5th century BC and went on for 700 years within Greece. So, yeah, it's incredible kind of history. And this secular tone towards light really enabled all the sort of subsequent discoveries about light to be made. And the main Greek debate, the main question that they, they asked was, does light come from the eye towards an object, or does it come from an object towards the eye? And this debate goes on for 700 years. The first man that they know who posed this question was called Empedocles, and he died in 435 BC. And he decided that light comes from the eye, and it's a fire that comes from the eye to an object. Plato agreed with him, but Aristotle didn't, and mainly because his argument was saying, well, if that was the case, then surely we'd be able to see in the dark, which does seem fairly obvious. Um, but anyway, this question went back and forth. And Aristotle said that light is an activity of something that is transparent, and that light comes from the object to the eye, and it's conveyed by a substance he called ether. So I mentioned this earlier, and, and Newton agreed with that. 
Well, and then in the 20th century, Einstein disproved this. But I think the idea of, of light coming from the eye to the object still really makes a lot of sense to me on, an, uh, on a kind of symbolic level, because the way we see, the way we see reality is so dependent on our own psychological makeup, how we feel and how, what we are like within ourselves. Uh, so it's also personal, the way we see reality. So you could say that the fire is really like our emotional attitude that we project out there onto, onto the world, onto our, our, our perception. So reality is subjective in that way. Well, this is a, a church in Ravenna in Italy. It's from the 5th century AD, so it's a very early uh, Byzantine church. And with, as we enter the, the Christian period out of the, out of the Roman period, the representation of light in art becomes extremely important because of the meaning of light to, to Christians. So in the Bible, uh, in Genesis, uh, written... 600 BC it was written. Um, in Genesis, it actually says that the very first words that God utters are, let there be light. And it's only on the fourth day of creation that God creates the sun, the moon, and the stars. So in some ways, this is sort of a bit similar to the Greek attitude to light. It's, it, enables, it, it enables light to be studied. It's no longer so divine in that sense. It's, it's separating it from its celestial sources. It's separating it from the sun, the moon, and the stars. And it enables it to be studied. But then at the, on the other side of the coin, it's also, you know, the light of God. It's, you know, light is, is divine as well. So because light is divine, the idea of bringing light into these sacred spaces is you know incredibly important, and it's inter it's, it's it's try to try and imagine yourselves at that at this time, when you really did believe in God and you really did believe in a heaven in and a paradise, a paradise that was beyond our darkness. When we look when we go out and we look out at the dark, you just see it as a great dark void that goes on and on and on in space. Whereas maybe then when they went out into the darkness that they were really seeing the shadow of earth, and that beyond that shadow was paradise and was heaven, the, the light of heaven. And so the, when, you met, when they made their churches, they wanted to bring this light into the church, and you would go in there and you would be bathing yourself in the light of God. You know, what a wonderful thing to experience in some ways. Yeah. Um, and so, so the representation of light, the use of light in churches, and then also the use of light on the, on the, the representation of light on frescoes, on mosaics, uh, and, and with stained glass windows becomes very, very important. In these Byzantine churches in Ravenna, you go in there and they're completely covered in mosaic. And a lot of that mosaic is gold. And so you go in there and it's sparkling with light. It's a, it's a wonderful, wonderful experience to go into these churches. Well, this is an, as an icon, and it's called The Transfiguration of Jesus, Our Saviour, by Theophanes the Greek from the 1400s. And so often uh, in the Bible, in the, in, the, in the New Testament, when Christ appears or when one of the apostles is having a sort of divine revelation, it takes the form of light. And so light is, not, is, light is very symbolic of salvation, redemption, revelation, all these things. It comes in the form of light. And so in this particular moment, when Christ appears to three of his disciples, he appears as this great white, beaming white light on the top of the mountain. But in the, in the, at this time in the Roman Empire, the Roman Empire is divided into two parts. You have the Eastern Empire ruled from Constantinople, uh, and you have, or Byzantine, and then you have the Western Empire ruled from Rome. And these two, the, the art that comes from these two 
separate parts of the Roman Empire, they go on different trajectories. So the Eastern Empire art, of which this emanates, is this part of, this art is not interested in naturalism. It's purely involved in telling the Christian story, in, theolog in, in visual uh, representation of Christian theology. <laughs> It goes a very, it's not until the 17th century that the Eastern art really starts to become more and more representational. Whereas art coming from, from the Western Empire uh, is becomes, its main goal really is towards greater and greater realism. So they have different attitudes to the, in their aims in, with the art. So here we have a church in Gloucestershire it's a town called Fairford, and it has, the, it has a complete set of stained glass windows. It has the most complete set of stained glass windows in Britain, which is 28 windows displaying biblical scenes. And this is just two, two of them, two of these windows. So the use of stained glass in, becomes incredibly important in northern European uh, churches and cathedrals, bringing the light of God into uh, these, these great buildings and telling the Christian story. That's just a, a detail of, of uh, the, the, the stained glass window, the last judgment, the day of judgment. It's an image of hell, a sort of monster on the far right there. And it's an amazing story of survival um, these, there are still 28 windows still there today. So you've got in 1534, you have the Reformation, and lots and lots of images were destroyed at that time, either sculptures and stained glass in the, in the English churches. Then in 1642, you had the Civil War, when the Puritans <clears throat> destroyed huge amounts of, of stained glass windows and paintings and you know, religious imagery, because that was considered idolatrous. Um, and then, and then the other, apparently the Roundheads, who were associated with the Puritans, they marched through a local ta a town very near to Fairford called Sirencester, and they quickly managed to get down all the windows, and they hid all the windows, and they were protected, and then they put them back at the end of the Civil War. And then in the Second World War, the windows were removed again and stored in a cellar, so they're still surviving today, all this time later. So here we have a fresco by Giotto called The Lamentation, and it's in the Scrivani Chapel in Padua from 1305. And with a fresco, you're putting pigment into wet plaster, and you have to work very, very quickly. So, and you can't create lots of different shades uh, within this medium. It's a very limited medium to work with. So to get a great sense of realism is pretty difficult with in, a, in, in a fresco compared to the later use of oil painting. But you can see here that this artist is trying to depict light. And he's, he's, by his use of light, he's creating a sense of three dimensions to those figures. So the light source is from above, slightly to the left, and great roundedness to all the backs of those figures, and then you have the shadows in the folds of the material. But because he's then put the gold leaf around for the halos, that immediately sort of flattens um, the figures, flat, flattens them onto the surface, so it reduces a sense of depth on the image. But he's definitely trying to represent a great sense of realism in this work. But then, just about 100 years later, you start getting these kind of very realistic paintings. And this is the Arnolfini Wedding by Jan van Eyck from 14, 14, 1434 in the National Gallery. And, you know, how was he able to do this? Um, in a relatively short length of time, suddenly these artists are creating super realistic work. And David Hockney calls it the optical look. And he did a lot of research about the use of mirrors and lenses. The artists might have been using these 
tools to enable them to make more realistic work. It's a fascinating book. I really recommend it. It's called The Secret, no Secret Knowledge. You can actually watch the whole series on YouTube today if you want to go, go and do it. And what he did, one of the things that he did, I'll just show you the ne uh, next page, next slide. So here are two details of this picture. Well, with that chandelier, it looks totally three-dimensional, doesn't it? Incredibly difficult thing to draw that on a flat surface. And you know what a good draftsman David Hockney is. Okay? So he got an exact replica made of the chandelier, and he tried to draw it. And he was completely defeated, but he just couldn't do it. It's so difficult to do that on a flat, you know, flat surface, an illusion of that detail. And he then got a concave mirror and stood in a particular position related to the object and the light source. And he was able then to project an image of that onto, onto the wall. He then gets a bit of tracing paper. Hey, presto, you've got a very, very good image of that chandelier. And so his theory is that artists at this time start, you know, mirrors with, of good enough quality, concave mirrors. A concave mirror enlarges an image, whereas a convex shrinks it. They were good enough quality to do this. So his theory is that this is what artists were doing at this time. Um, it wasn't that they just were suddenly brilliant draftsmen, which does seem a rather ludicrous you know, uh, reason, which is basically what most art historians have, have said. Um, up until people like David Hockney start to actually really experiment themselves with it. But other than that, there was also a new medium that artists started to use, which was oil paint. So with oil paint, you have far greater flexibility than you do with, with tempera or with fresco. With oil paint, it dries very, very slowly, so you can you know, alter your mistakes can, and you can build up glaze upon glaze upon glaze, one glaze upon another glaze and upon another glaze, and build up a great sense of light and dark, not just two or three shades, you know, 20 shades between the lightest part and the darkest part of a picture. And you can get great sense of kind of luminosity in your colours as well, which you can't do with, with, with fresco or with tempera. So it's a very, very versatile, wonderful medium for artists to use with, with oil paint. And you can, you, you can take advantage of sort of shiny surfaces. So on the chandelier here, he's painting the light reflected off the, that shiny surface. Um, and again, with the, with the convex mirror, he's got the image of, of the painting reflected in the mirror behind. That there is the image. And, the mirror between the, the man and the woman there. And the light obviously coming from the window, then he's taking advantage of all the effects of that light coming in through the window. So this is uh, Leonardo da Vinci's painting, the Virgin with the infant St. John the Baptist, adoring the Christ child, accompanied by an angel from 1491. And with this painting, the drama is all, is, has been created by the use of light and dark in his work, Chioscuro. And compared to the, the, the previous picture, um, this, this painting, the, the, the contours are much, much sort of softer. They don't have those quite sharp edges to the, to all, to the, to the forms and the figures. And his, um, Leonardo's technique is called sfumato, or smoky effect. And through, he creates that smoky effect by, in the final glazes, he puts just a very tiny amount of brown pigment in it, very, very small amount, which kind of softens the edges, the, softens the contours. But, so you've got almost like a kind of spotlight effect on the figures. And then the landscape is quite dark, this strange rocky landscape. And then the eye then goes to, that, to the light in that beautiful blue landscape in the distance there. And you can see there that he's perceived that with the sky, 
when you, when you look directly above you at the sky, you have a deep blue, a sort of ultramarine blue, and then as you, are, as you look closer and closer to the horizon, the blue gets paler and paler and paler till it's almost white when it hits the horizon, which you can see here. And it's also perceived that when we look to distant hills and mountains, they appear blue, because they're looking through all the scattered blue wavelength to the distant mountains. But Leonardo, um, he studied all the contemporary um, theories about, about light, about, of optics, and also the translations from the Greek philosophers and the Middle Eastern philosophers. So he knew, you know, he'd, stu he'd, done, he'd done his studies, and he was fascinated in, in light, and then obviously in the representation of light in his work. And being a scientist as well, he did um, dissections of the human eye. And, um, but you can see here in, in this drawing, he's actually given the, he's made the lens rounded, which it's not. It's actually a spherical shape. And apparently what he did was that it's quite difficult to dissect an eye because when you put your scalpel into it, it collapses its shape. And so in order to, for it to hold its shape, he, he boiled it in egg white, and so it became stiff. But then that distorted the shape, and it, just, it made the lens rounded rather than spherical. So he's responding to his own, you know, the limitations of, of knowledge at that time, but he's also exploring it and trying to understand uh, how the eye works. But you can see the optic nerve there going, going into the brain. And here on these two pages, it's all about his, his studies of the dilation of the pupil. And he completely understood what happens, what happens to the, the pupil, the dilation of the pupil, when we, we say we're in, when we're in light and we look into a dark room, we can't really see anything. But then when we go into the dark room, we gradually are able to see because the pupil opens to allow more light in. And he's, he did lots of studies, and he completely understood what was going on there. Well, although the kind of general kind of journey of Western art is towards greater realism through the use of representation of light and the use of perspective, they're, of course, an extraordinary individualist, and it's often the individualists who really stand out from the crowd. And one of those great individualists is this artist called Matthias Grunewald. And he, he made this painting in 1515 in Colmar, which is very close to Strasbourg. And it's the resurrection and transfiguration of Jesus. And there's no image like it that I've ever seen anyway. And it combines this kind of cosmic Christ um, an, an image of, yeah, extraordinary image of transcendence and, and light with very sort of earthy and kind of mundane imagery. And so at the bottom of the picture, you've got this sleeping soldier right, right way across the, the picture there, and then the other one sort of resting behind him. And then, completely defying gravity, you've got this enormous shroud that sort of soars up through the night, night sky and out of which kind of unravels Christ. And around him is this huge, great golden halo, or a cosmic sun, and he sort of holds his hands up, like, you know, to show us as the stigmata. And with the, sh with the shroud, it goes through the whole spectrum, the whole rainbow, so you go from very kind of cold indigo blue through into crimson, into pure red, and scarlet and orange and yellow uh, in the whole, the whole works. And, and then, because, in a way, because the red is so dazzling, you then get an after image around the edge of the cosmic sun. So you get a turquoisey green shade around it, because that's a phenomenon that us humans have. If you, if you stare for a long time at a very, very bright color, preferably against a white wall, and then you look away to just an area of blank white, you will see the opposite colour to the colour you've been looking at. That's an, an afterimage phenomena that we have. So it's as if he's actually sort of tried to represent that in, the, in this image as well. 
Another of the great individualists is El Greco, and this is Agony in the Garden from 1590. It's in the Toledo Museum of Art in Spain. And for, for El Greco, it's, he paints a kind of light of divine ecstasy or spiritual ecstasy in his work. It's quite a different quality of light to his contemporaries. And in, in this image, you have quite sharp, quite, quite strongly contrasted chiaroscuro. You don't get lots of subtle shades. It's either very light or very dark in his work. And it's quite sort of abstractly composed as well. It's not really realistic at all. And with El Greco, his actual, his origins, he came from Crete, and he trained originally as an icon painter. So if you remember that icon I showed you of the, from Theophanes the Greek, that's the tradition that he trained in. So he was training, he was making icon paintings. And then he moved to Venice, and he came under the influence of, of Titian and, and his other contemporaries. And so he then develops this unique kind of visual language, which is a real sort of marriage between kind of the Eastern Orthodox tradition of painting and the Catholic Western tradition of painting. And he creates this very unique language. On this image, you've also got the light from the full moon on the right there. And because of the full moon, the light is being reflected off the, the spears of, of the soldiers. So that's a very important little detail. You wouldn't notice those spears without the reflection of the moon on them. And then you have the beam of light, the light from God, and all the light around the clouds here, and on, of course, on his gowns there. He also made beautiful portraits, such as this one from 1570s. It's just a boy blowing on an ember to light a candle, and it's in the main museum in Naples. So it's just kind of monochrome palette of, of browns and golds set against the darkness, and you, he's, his lips are pursed as he's breathing. He's breathing onto that ember, and you can just see a drop of wax is, is melting off the candle there. So I think with candles, I mean, we always light a candle to commemorate you know, either the passing of loved ones or just a, a sense of, of sacredness or a sense of specialness uh, with candles. And so traditionally, the, the, the best quality candles are made from beeswax. Uh, but if you were very poor in the old days, your candles were made from tallow, which apparently gave off a terrible, terrible smell um, and were very, very smelly and smoky as well. So not particularly good for your eyesight. So beeswax were the expensive candles that people would use, and also used in the church, of course, as well. So the pursuit of realism really peaks with Caravaggio. And this is one of his paintings, The Taking of Christ, from 1602. And it's in the main gallery, the National Gallery in Dublin. And Hockney has a good phrase, I think, for... Caravaggio, he says that he invented Hollywood lighting, which you can really see that in this image. It is spotlight lighting, isn't it? You're right close up, or, you know, we're being, it's, we're being told about the, we're the drama, you know, spotlight on the, all the faces, on the hands, everything else is darkness. There's not a lot of kind of mid-tones. It's either very light or very dark. And you can imagine that probably if he'd been born today, if Caravaggio was born today, he'd be a blockbuster movie director. Or the Martin Scorsese, I think he would have been, really, wouldn't he? Um, <clears throat> and pretty much all his paintings are set in darkness, such as this one. And we're right close up to the scene as well. So again, try and remind yourself, you know, before, before movies, before photography, if you saw a picture like this, it would have had a greater impact um, on an audience than it probably does today, you know, because, you know, you're, you would have had a sense of great real, realism to it. But still, it's still a pretty remarkable image. So Judas is, is, is bringing the uh, soldiers to arrest Christ, so he's leaning forward to kiss Christ, who sort of slightly you know, moves his face away. And kind of poignant gesture with his hands, holding his hands together like that. And I love this image of, this, this is probably Peter here, with this kind of horrified or terrified expression on his face, holding his hand up. 
Uh, this face here is, is, is meant to be a self-portrait of Caravaggio, and he's holding a lantern, so there's another light source, but that isn't the main light source. The main light source is in front. Um, and then he takes advantage of the, the shiny surface of the metal armor um, of the soldier there. So you have a very kind of bold, white highlight of light right across the middle of the picture, right there. So with, with Caravaggio, it is known that he owned a very, very large mirror, which would have been quite an expensive thing to, to, to own. And he probably would have used mirrors not only to um, spread the light around his studio, but also to copy from, because it's much, much easier to copy from an image reflected in, in a mirror than it is to, to draw in three dimensions. So, for instance, I mean, I'm an artist as well. So when I'm out drawing, if I'm struggling with my sense of space or perspective or sense of scale, um, I'll just get out my mobile phone and shrink the image onto a tiny little screen. And looking at it on a flat screen, it's much easier for me to make to see differences of scale um, on, that, on that flattened screen compared to in three dimensions. So artists have always used tools to help them. Uh, why wouldn't they, you know? Uh, <clears throat> and so I, I don't see it as cheating. It's just, a, it's just a, an available tool to use. I mean, we all, you know, Hockney uses his iPad, doesn't he? And he, he's been fascinated in the contrast between photography and painting and the use of iPad, creating iP drawings from iPads. So, <clears throat> so probably Caravaggio may well have copied images from his mirror. And interestingly, there's no surviving drawings by Caravaggio. Uh, why not? You know, have they all just disappeared and just been destroyed? Or maybe he didn't bother with drawing. He drew directly onto the canvas from an image that he saw in a mirror. Maybe. We can't prove these things. It's a huge subject, um, which I'm just mentioning. You can do your own research about that. <laughs> so, a couple of weeks ago, I was lucky enough to go to the Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam to see this magnificent Rembrandt exhibition on at the moment. There are exhibitions throughout Holland um, about Rembrandt because it's celebrating his 350th anniversary of his, of his death. And so I'm really soaked up all this stuff about Rembrandt at the moment. And just to put in a couple of portraits by him, uh, <clears throat> which uses the, the, the light, the design of his light is a typical way of lighting uh, for, for a portrait. And if you're a photographer, you will know of the phrase Rembrandt lighting. So if you want to go and have yourself photographed, tell the photographer, I want Rembrandt lighting, and they should know what you mean. This is what it is. It's when the light source is from the left, but slightly around, just far enough, so it catches the cheekbone on the far side of your face. And it's a really beautiful way of lighting. It's quite flattering. And, and, and because you're not, because part of you is in darkness, it adds a sense of kind of mystery. You want to get to know the person a bit more. It just draws you more in to looking at the image for a bit longer than you would do if it was full frontal lighting. So you can see in both these self-portraits, he's used that, that positioning of the light, and then you've got it there on the photograph there. So with these two self-portraits, the one on the right, he's aged just 23, looking over his shoulder. He's a proud, ambitious young artist. Ah, whereas here, in this one, many years later, he's 52. He's just had to sell his entire collection, his huge house that he owned, he's had to sell that. He's completely and utterly bankrupt. Uh, he's lost his first wife. He has, he's now actually quite happy with his, his, his second partner. They, weren't, they didn't marry. Um, he's lost quite a few children have died. So in this other portrait, here he is. He's kind of dressed up in quite a grand outfit. And he's holding... His, his cane there, that's actually a tool that artists use to rest their arm on their canvas. It's called a maul stick. So he's holding as if it's a very grand cane, as if he's a very wealthy merchant or something. 
he's actually impoverished at this time. Uh, but you can see in the face, he's got incredible empathy. I think that's, what his, that's where he is so remarkable, is his empathy, and how he then is able to paint that. But if you're an artist obsessed with light, which Rembrandt was, etchings, printmaking, is the perfect medium for you. He wasn't a great colorist. I mean, his color palette is pretty narrow. It's really just golds and browns and red. That's about it. Uh, <clears throat> so etching is a perfect medium because it's just black and white, and you can create wonderful light effects. And in this Rijksmuseum exhibition, it had the entire collection of etchings from the Rijksmuseum on display, and it was fabulous. Top left, you've got a self-portrait with his first wife, Saskia, from 1636. Again, dramatic lighting. His face is in shadow from the hat. Uh, so you get the light from the left again, but it's just catching the right-hand side of his cheek there. And then on the here, this is also a self-portrait, uh, quite a bit later, standing in a window, and he's actually making an etching there. There he is at work. But it's quite very strong contrast between the lights and the dark. You've got this image of the three trees and the landscape with the shaft of light coming down on the left-hand side in contrast to the darkness, um, sorry, the light of the light behind the trees and the darkness of the trees. And then the bottom left was a beautiful image. It's called Antiope and Jupiter, and it's the story of Jupiter kind of surprising a, a naked sleeping nymph. And then this, it, I mean, I think it must be one of the greatest <laughs> etchings ever made. It was extraordinary. And it's only about this big. You just go into it and you get right up close. And the, 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 the drama um, and the use of light is so modern, so powerful, with these, just these stri stripes, these lines of light and dark in the sky. Uh, behind the three crucified figures there. And then all different qualities of energy. Some is very finished work. This is quite finished and detailed, whereas that is just sort of empty and very abbreviated. E extraordinary image. I really recommend go onto the website and look at these etchings. Go to the Reichs Museum and look at them. They're a remarkable um, imagery. So here we have a painting by Vermeer from 1665. It's in the National Gallery in Washington, the girl with the red hat. It's a very small picture. It's just 22 by 18 centimeters. And you get close up to it, and you're so close to the image, you can actually see the moisture on her lip. You're that close to her. It's a very sensual painting. It's a remarkable painting for its, for its time. Even today, it's a remarkable image. So it's, it's all about using the light in this picture to kind of draw us in. I mean, most of her is actually in shadow. The, all the left-hand side of her face is in shadow. So the light is coming from the right. And it's just the light is being reflected off the areas of her face where there's moisture. So you actually can see a bit of moisture right inside her lip there. And then, of course, on her lips, on the tip of her nose, and on the moisture on her eye. So that's really important, that little bit of light just catching the eye in the shadow there. Also, the light on the earrings. You wouldn't notice that earring if there wasn't that highlight. Then this lovely blue silk. Uh, he's actually used a, a yellow for the for the the highlights on that reflect, with that reflected light there. And then the shiny, kind of polished lion's head of the, of the chair there again. So every surface that reflects light, he's taking advantage of to create a much more interesting image um, in this picture. The, 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 the um, red hat, you have, this has been x-rayed, so I know. So the underpainting, He's used uh, an opaque red pigment, a vermilion, which is opaque. And then on top of that, he's used a transparent pigment, which is called a red lake, on top. So there's no, if you want to create a great sense of light, reflected light, you, there's no point using, a trans, uh, sorry, using an opaque pigment. You need to use a transparent pigment. So artists need to know that 
They need to know about their pigments, <laughs> otherwise you're going to waste a lot of expensive pigment. So the final layer is a transparent red pigment, and that's why it's really glowing, that red, the red hat there. Oops, sorry. This is a painting by an English artist, Joseph Wright of Derby. He's known, Joseph Wright of Derby. And it's called A Philosopher Giving That Lecture on the Orrery in which a lamp is put in place of the sun. And it's made in 1766, and it's in the Derby Museum and Art Gallery. And Joseph Wright, he was fascinated in all the discoveries that were taking place, the Age of Enlightenment in England at that time. And he was a member of a society called the Lunar Society of Birmingham. And they were a mixture of, well, like him, and people who were interested in science and philosophy. And every month they would meet at somebody's house on a full moon night, so they, there would be light for them to get home, and that's why they call them the Lunar Society. And they called themselves the Lunatics. And this society still exists today in Birmingham, and it promotes contemporary science. And so Joseph Wright made this his subject matter. And so it's interesting. So now, instead of getting together people in a picture, responding with awe and wonder at a Christian miracle being performed, there, a sense of awe and wonder at having the solar system explained to them. And he's done other paintings about scientific experiments, etc., in his work. So this becomes a new genre which he is a pioneer of. And of course, he's fascinated in creating drama through light and dark effects. So he's been influenced by the followers of Caravaggio in, in, in his work. So you've got this orrery, which is a mechanical solar system. And this, instead of uh, the, the candle which lights it is behind that, the silhouette of that figure, so we can't see it. You can see, I think this looks like Saturn here with the rings around it. And maybe, sorry, no, yeah, Saturn and then Jupiter, probably. So Uranus wasn't known about at this time. You have the philosopher who looks a bit like Isaac Newton. He is describing the solar system and the man to the left is taking down notes. But it's incredibly, you know, incredibly um, well-designed composition. Uh, and it's all about different, you know, darkness and light. So with her, you just get the light, you know, on, her, on the profile there. And then the, all the rest of her is in darkness. Little touch of red there. And then full light on these two little children. And then this figure, you just get the light on the edge of their eye. And then a strip of color here and here. And then the, he's looking at him and he's really contemplating, you know, what he's absorbing what he's being told about our solar system. But then when we move into the 19th century, we get a lot of paintings of lovers uh, standing in, in, a, in a moonlit night uh, with a sense of, kind of, sense of beauty and transcendence, but also a touch of, kind of melancholiness as well, because obviously that experience doesn't last very long. Um, and I don't mean the love necessarily, but the, you know, the, the, moon, the full moon, the light of the moon doesn't last very long before it starts to shrink again. And so the use of light in, in, in these artists' works, it's all, they use light as an expression of transcendence. Uh, so they're not painting lots of Christian imagery anymore. It's images such as this becomes very, very common with artists at this time. And, what, and this is by Caspar David Friedrich, the, the great German romantic artist. It's just called Man and Woman Contemplating the Moon from 1818. And he did lots of pictures of people contemplating the moon. And also, of course, in music, you have um, Beethoven's Moonlight Sonata. You have Chopin's Nocturnes. And all the romantic poets, Shelley, Coleridge, Keats, Wordsworth, they all write poems about the moon. And this whole idea of nature mirroring the, the soul, the way we feel. So that's what these paintings are all about. So that's one of them. And then here's another one by Friedrich, of these three figures on a rock, um, in, 
looking out over the Baltic, watching the full moon rise above those clouds, and these mysterious sort of ghost-like sailing ships as well. I just read you a quote from Friedrich, because I think it expresses very well the kind of relationship that the romantic artist and poet has to their work and to nature. He says, I must stay alone and know that I am alone to contemplate and feel nature in full. I have to surrender myself to what encircles me. I have to merge with my clouds and rocks in order to be what I am. Solitude is indispensable for my dialogue with nature. Well, the equivalent artist over in Britain is Samuel Palmer. And this is by him, is the, the, the Harvest Moon from 1833. And Samuel Palmer, he was born a Londoner, uh, but he wanted to escape from all the kind of industrial noise and smell and, and etc. He hated it all, all that and went out to live in the countryside in a place called Shoreham in Kent. And he went with some other fellow romantic artists to live there in a very sort of utopian way. And they made, he, he made these very utopian images of people working together, the whole community working together to bring in the harvest. So they're visionary paintings. Uh, he, that is sort of how he's classified, the visionary art. And his great guru in regards to um, art teachers was William Blake. And William Blake used to come and visit uh, Shoreham and stay, stay with them. And they'd you know, listen to every word he said and soak it up. And everything that, you know, everything that Blake stood for, they believed in. So they believed in making art that expressed a spiritual dimension that they felt flowed through everything within ourselves and through all material matter. And he tries to express that in his work. So here we have a watercolour by Turner. It's Arundel Castle with a rainbow from 1824 and it's a watercolour. So if you're fascinated in light, watercolour is the perfect medium because it's a transparent medium on a white, on a white material, on, on white paper. So you have all the white of the paper coming through, which creates a sense of light. And of course here he's fascinated in the rainbow and the rainbow being bent uh, as the light travels through and reflected through the water there. He also, so it's a combination of quite a kind of sublime image, but then being typical Turner, he brings in really sort of ordinary imagery as well. So you have the two women here fishing there. Um, you have the man on the right there with his boat loaded probably with sacks of grain that have been milled um, in the windmill there. And here we have another painting, but here we have the phenomena of two rainbows which doesn't happen very often. I have seen it a couple of times. Uh, this particular what, painting is by John Everett Millet, and it's called The Blind Girl from 1856. It's in the Birmingham City Art Gallery. So it's probably two, two sisters uh, begging for, their, for food, and the, one of them, the one on the left, is blind, and she's got a little note around her neck saying, Pity the Poor. So she's probably been playing her concertina to raise some money for their next meal. And there's obviously the, this, we've now got this wonderful phenomena of the two rainbows, but she can't appreciate it with her eyes, but she can with her other senses. So she's obviously feeling the sun on her face, uh, feeling the warmth after the rainstorm. And she's sitting very, very still because there's a rain, sorry, there's a, a, a butterfly just sitting there on her shawl and she's fiddling with a bit of grass. Whereas her sighted sister, the light is so bright that she has to kind of shade her eyes as she looks out at the double rainbow. But it's dazzling colour and you have the contrast of the yellows of the grass with the, the blackness of the crows on the field there. And apparently when this painting was exhibited, it was pointed out to him that he'd painted the order of the colours of the second rainbow incorrectly. Because with a, with a single rainbow, the outer colour is the red and the inner is the blue. 
But when you get a double rainbow, there's an, a second refraction, and the colours are reversed. So the outer colour is the blue, and the inner is red. Well, he, hasn't, he hadn't seen that, and he'd got it wrong. He just repeated what an ordinary, a single rainbow. So he did apparently go away and change it, but you can't really see it, sorry, in, in this image. But he did check, correct it um, afterwards. So I think one of the greatest watercolours for me ever made is, is this one by Turner. It's called the Blue Rigi Lake Lucerne, Switzerland, at sunrise from 1842. And this is um, the Lake Lucerne, and he made four visits to Switzerland, and he would do tiny little watercolour sketches about this big on site, and then back in his studio in London, he made these finished exhibition pieces. This is 30 centimetres by 45 centimetres. So this is a finished image. And because it's sunrise, you've got these very kind of cool colour palettes. So you have a cool lemon yellow, and then the underpainting for the mountain is a soft pink. And then he's put some cool blues, blue washes, over the, over the terracotta kind of pink colour. And then all the light has been reflected in the water, and you still have just one star there being reflected in the, in the water. There it is there, and there it is there. So it's a real sense of just kind of peace and, and stillness in this image. But then he would do the same place, but from a slightly different vantage point at sunset, and he would completely go to very hot colours. And this was a classic thing that Turner did. He went from cool to hot, light to dark, violent storms to total peace and tranquility. It was all these very kind of powerful opposites that he worked with. So now, because it's sunset, you've got a golden yellow, and the underpainting for the mountain is quite a strong terracotta, an Indian red, probably. And then on top of that, he's got these blue, uh, the blue wash over the top there. And then all the foreground, you have very kind of striking, you know, quite hot browns and reds and golds with the, with the deep blue as well. Well, in 1837, the first photograph that is fixed um, is created by, in, by well, two people. We don't really know who was the very first person. There's Louis d'Aguerre in Paris and Henry Fox Talbot in England at, at about the same time. So the, they made their first permanent image. Um, I don't know who did this actual one, but I, I put it up for a reason. You'll see in a minute. Um, and so now that people were able to go and take a black and white photograph, this is obviously going to have a huge impact on what artists are going to do, painters are going to do. So they no longer have a monopoly on kind of true to life images, because the person can go and take a photograph much more successfully. Okay, it is black and white, but still. So artists are going to have to become far more inventive with what they do with their work from, from now on. So this is what Monet does with the Houses of Parliament. So <clears throat> Monet, in 1900, he comes over to, to London. He makes 100 views of the Thames. Uh, <clears throat> there are 19 views from this actual vantage point. His studio was in St. Thomas's Hospital, the other side of the river, looking across to Westminster. And he made 19 views, all of this same view, but painted at different times of day, dawn to dusk and in different weathers. So, of course, he was ob obsessed with creating an image about the, the, the transitory nature of what we see, what we're looking at. Everything is in constant change all the time as the light and the weather conditions change. It doesn't matter what the motif is. That's not important. It doesn't matter really that it's the Houses of Parliament. It could be anything. It could be a haystack, isn't it, with Monet. What's important is him capturing at a particular moment what he sees, looking through the different you know, weather conditions and the quality of light. So here we've got sort of turquoises and different shades of blue and apricots and pinks and yellows um, in, in this particular image. So of course the use of colour becomes incredibly important in, in contrast to black and white photography. So colour becomes liberated and also artists are now much more able to get very good quality paints. You, you could now go to an art shop and buy a tube of ready mixed paint and there were many more colours that artists could buy from as well compared to 
earlier times, like with Turner, was more limited, say, in colours to, to Monet. So here are a couple more. So there's another one. So with the Impressionists, because the Impressionists, they get out of their studios, they go and paint out in nature, they're trying to capture what they see in front of them. This is the huge difference between them and previous art artists who were who are going, going for walks in the countryside, doing little sketches, but then their paintings were done in the, entirely in the studio. Another difference is in the medium. So as I said, there were many more pigments that artists could use, but also with the Impressionists, they didn't want all that very kind of glossy paint uh, that artists of the past would use. And because they were working quickly in time out in the landscape, they had to, they had to you know, they used their paint very quickly. They couldn't work slowly with lots of glazes, one glaze upon another upon another, which is where the old artists worked. They just would use, squirt, of, you know, squeeze a bit of paint onto their palette and use just maybe two or three layers of paint and that was it. And, and they didn't want it to be very glossy, so they would often put, their, put a bit of blotting paper and soak up excess oil. They, didn't, they wanted a more sort of chalky effect. And then they didn't varnish their paintings, so whereas old art, they would varnish it. So they weren't, they weren't sort of heightened and glossy like old art. They were creating light effects through their contrast and subtleties of colour, rather than all these kind of lot of gloss medium that they, they, they weren't using in that way. So here's another one of his. So he did 25 haystacks in the snow. And of course I put this in because of the blue shadows. So this is a new thing. So if you look at 17th century Dutch snowy scenes, you don't see bright blue shadows. You see sort of khaki gray or green or brown. That's it, you don't see blue. So this is the first time you see bright blue shadows on a, on a sunny, snowy day. I'm just going to go over about five minutes. I hope that's all right with you. Uh, it's gone on a bit. <laughs> so just to show you a couple of contemporary artists interested in light. So this is one of David Hockney's drawings, just using coloured crayons. And he's fascinated in the distortions as light travels through the denser medium of water compared to travelling through air. And it's through, it's through drawing that he really, you know, you really learn about what's out there. Um, drawing is a wonderful thing to do. It's a sustained and kind of committed act of looking. And it's from that that, that you're then able to create a visual language for your paintings because you've acquired all that knowledge of what really is going on out there. So this is one of his paintings. And you can see it's not realistic, but he, he from his drawings, and then he creates this sort of, it's quite abstract, it's not realistic, obviously, these spiralling light marks on the, on the surface of the water, but he creates a, a sign to represent the effect of light on water. And uh, so his work is really interesting, I think, because it rests in the sort of space between abstraction and representation. That's where it, it, he holds our atten people's attention, I think. Um, and so, and then he puts probably his object of desire at the top of the picture. It has a lovely display of light effects, doesn't he? Well, this is a painting by Bridget Riley. And um, this particular painting is called Late Morning. And when you look at it, I can't see it so well at this angle, but I know from when I've looked at it before, it's as if a kind of pale, cool yellow light is emanating from the centre going outwards. Can you see it? <laughs> That's what I remember anyway. And she's fact, so her, it's interesting that she calls it late morning. So it's all about creating an image which for her expresses a sense, a quality of light that she perceived in the, in the late morning. She must have gone for a walk in the countryside or something. But she creates this, idea, this image through just a repetition of the vertical lines, and it's just a repetition of the same colours. So you've got turquoise, red, yellow, white. Turquoise, red, yellow, white. And then, you know, there's no central point, but of course we tend to look at the centre 
and then we get this effect of the lemon yellow radiating out from the centre. She says about her work, she says, I don't paint light, I present a colour situation which releases light as you look at it. Well, I'll just show you a couple of my own paintings, as I, I make paintings, and, and mainly at the moment I'm making sculpture, but that's difficult to show uh, on, a, on an image, particularly when you're working with light, so painting it's easier. So here's a, here's a painting I did. I went on, the, on a lecture tour of Australia, and was you know, awestruck by the stars, as everyone is. So this is my image of kind of, it's called stargazing in Australia. So there's two tiny little figures on the red rock looking up at the nighttime sky. So the stars are now just sort of circles held within a square. And to express my sense of kind of wonder, I've got one of the stars opening out into these four feathers and then contrasting the white light from the stars to the lights from the city tower blocks and the, and, the, and the cars. And this is another one by me called Love is in the Air. And so the idea is I've got sort of the elements all together and creating sort of airy effect full of light. And you've got an island in the sea at the bottom and then a figure rises up out of the island here there's the face there, and holds a hand up with a ring. So it's like offering the ring up to the sky above. And then the other arm becomes a piece of wheat, and the seeds fall down, and there are some embracing lovers under the, under the wheat there. So I wanted to convey a great sense of light, lightness of touch and light itself. And the final image with the, where we began with an image of the sun, but this is an artwork. It's called The Weather Project by Oliver Eliasson. And in 2003, he was commissioned to do one of the installations at the Turbine Hall in Tate Modern. He's a Danish Icelandic artist. So, of course, the British weather is a perfect subject for us. And he creates this giant sun with just hundreds and hundreds of little lights. And there was a massive mirror in the ceiling as well that reflected that, that light. And then hidden in the, in the sides of the building were humidifiers, which created this mist. And it was a wonderful experience. And here's a sort of experience. A lot of these artists create sort of stage sets for audiences to go and experience an effect. And so the, the mist would sort of gather over us, and then it would sort of rise up and evaporate. I mean, you didn't actually feel rainfall, but you could have done. Um, and so, yeah, it was, a, it was a beautiful experience. So that's Oliver Eliasson, The Weather Project. And he's such a hugely successful artist, international artist who lives in Berlin. He employs over 90 people to make his work, um, which you know, is exhibited all around the world. Um, Oliver Eliasson. So that's the final slide. And what I like to do when I finish is just very, very quickly zoom back through everything I've shown you, just to remind you of what you've seen, so you don't just remember the last image, and to remind you of the, sort of the context, the story um, that I've been trying to tell you of how artists have used light in their work.